Es nuestra tercera sesión de Rizoma y en primer lugar quería recordaros que hoy también vamos a anunciar al final del evento el ganador del Open Call, que es, que es y que no es un Baserri y hoy ha venido a visitarnos el, el ganador también que nos hará una pequeña explicación sobre ese tema. Eh, al final llevamos de, durante el mes de noviembre tres, o sea, cuatro sesiones ¿no? en las que hemos tenido eh, un happening, hemos tenido una performance, hemos tenido un objeto, hemos tenido también algún accidente y varios eh, coloquios donde hemos intentado desmitificar el mundo rural a través de las teorías y conceptos filosóficos de, de Lois y Guattari. Eh, hoy venimos a presentar eh, Territorio Exhausto, eh, un coloquio que nos va a hacer mirar y explorar y abrir nuevas líneas para reflexionar con el territorio, de buscar alianzas con otras formas de vida y de reflexionar sobre los recursos y la obtención de energía, siempre mirando al futuro y evitando dogmas y creencias sobre lo que miramos, sobre cómo miramos lo existente. Eh, Joan will be our moderator. She will be presenting and moderating and joining us. Eh, we have our special guest, Lara, Sebastián and Carles. Joan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the presentation and thank you for hosting us here. Um, the talk will be in English, but I think if uh, you ask questions in Spanish, it's all okay. I have a bit of an echo here. Um, so we understand actually uh, Spanish, but it's just that uh, the English is more uh, the um, normal language for me. Sorry for that. No, I think it will be fine, but... Uh, so. Let's see if that works. Yes. Um, as we started to, uh, as I started to think about this, uh, this notion of exhausted territory, I mean, first of all, I'm an architect, so I'm not so acquainted with territory, as I'm working really local in uh, south of French, uh, France with culture. Um, so I know nothing about territory, and I know not much neither about here. So what I did was, in order to cope with my own ignorance, I started to investigate on different documents I was given, and as well as anybody would do, uh, looking on Google and finding out some things on Wikipedia. So, I mean, that was basically what I had, a nice romanticized image of what Baseri was. Uh, Wikipedia in French, it's actually quite complete on what Baseri should be, And it tells the whole story about all of this. That was also something given. Thank you very much for this drawing, by the way. So uh, with that, I could understand that the Baseri was an architectural archetype, a social entity, a house, a factory, a farm, a kingdom, a network of kingdoms, with well-kept governance and power structures, a way to control land, ensure local sustainability, and so on. So it's everything at once. There seems to be no limit to what the Baseri is or represents, In the same way, there seems to be no limit to what territory is as well. So what I understood as Baseri, from my perspective at first as an ignorant, was this. You will see some images from the publication I'm in charge of in southern France uh, that you see some, some uh, issues here. Uh, so we did that as an uh, inquiry on the local uh, houses, uh, territories in Toulouse. And this is what we have, you see, downstairs there, There are uh, Basque houses, so fake ones, basically. Um, and we can explain that because Philippe Ram in the book uh, Histoire naturelle de l'architecture uh, was identifying a trend that was uh, French people going to the seaside because suddenly iodine became the cure of different thyroid sicknesses. So basically the seaside became something very interesting for uh, everybody and started urbanization as such. Then we took from the seaside what was uh, good for health, and therefore the Basque houses become uh, Toulouse houses. So in the 40s, they started to conquer faraway territories, fading its whole signification and virtues into the simplification of an adapted image turned into a prefabricated product of domestic consumption. But, well, I realized more or less that if I was going to stick with architecture, I would not going anywhere with territory. So uh, I stepped a bit back and I uh, started to, 
change the, the lens I was using to look at territory as there is just one in the formulation of you propose, that you propose. It's not territories, it's territory. So I started to question this. What does it mean? So this is an image of um, the book of Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, uh, that I coined in the lecture of uh, Bruno Latour that I will speak about uh, later. So we see a uh, character with power and um, uh, spirituality. It's a king with a lot of, uh, like, reigning on a territory. But if we look closer, in fact, he's made of many people. So, in fact, he's caring of the common ground, and it's a critic, apparently, of um, the Commonwealth in uh, England in 1651. So we see that territory is made up of urban and agriculture. Uh, and changing focus transforms the way we understand the same issue. So uh, in an attempt to redefine today what is territory, Latour proposes to ask again the five questions that were asked to Hobbes in that symbolized that Leviathan figure, and I think it's quite interesting. It's the question of theos, the authority, so to which authority are we willing to submit? The question of nomos, the law, which rule are we willing to apply? The question of logos, the knowledge, which field of knowledge and competence do we address to understand each other? The question of cosmos, which distribution of capacities among agencies? And of course, the last question is about us, about demos, who are we and what demos are we forming? Are we able to discuss the world in which we want to commonly evolve and be? That's a lot. So this common ground reminded me also of uh, the Commonwealth diggers of San Francisco, uh, the counterculture of California, and later Illich and the Friends making a declaration on soil before the Brazilian International Earth Summit in 1992. They wrote a small statement in which we can read, not so much, but I can tell. Um, this is in French, I have the English version. Uh, we note that such virtue is traditionally found in labor, craft, dwelling and suffering supported not by an abstract earth, environment or energy system, but by the particular soil these very actions have enriched with their traces. Yet, in spite of this ultimate bond between soil and being, soil and the good, philosophy has not brought forth the concept that would allow us to relate virtue to common soil, something vastly different from managing behavior on a shared planet. So we were torn from the bonds to soil, the connection that limited action making practical virtue possible, when modernization insulated us from plain dirt, from toil, flesh, soil, and grave. The economy into which we have been absorbed, some willy-nilly, some at great cost, transforms people into interchangeable morsels of population ruled by the laws of scarcity. So let's all basically is asking uh, the question of territory and what is then the issue with it, and it's major actually right now, uh, is making a, or proposing a new political divide and opposing two different uh, oppositions uh, to the ancient, ancient climatic regime. There is the new climatic regime. Territory has bounded identity, overlapping territories, emancipation from territory or held, held by the earth system, globalization, against localization, human Sinolocene, earthbound in Anthropocene, one humanity, multiple sovereignties. But what it means is, I think, quite interesting, because it doesn't mean that it's either or, it means that it's at the same time both. We need to be aware that territory can systematically be discussed from opposite positions that truly represents an emergency. So, I mean, that was territory. Now there is exhaustion. <laughs> so basically, of course, after all of this, I, I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. So almost, let's say. But to understand this notion of exhaustion, I would say, um, even though it might seem a bit of an easy shortcut, I would propose to personalize territory um, that might help us to understand how we could react. Because we should not let the territory deal on its own with the exhaustion we caused. So. And this is, for example, what a look on territory from afar and what we did uh, from the same journal. So why is the territory exhausted? Maybe because we have uh, abused from it, or maybe because we take too much, maybe because we ask too much, we extract too much, we dry it out until it breaks. 
And when people are exhausted, what they need is support, care, attention, and culture. When a child damages or hurts somebody else, ap apologizes are never enough. The child shall promise he will make better next time. He or she shall say he or she will never do that again. And for that, they need to acknowledge that they did something wrong and not even feel guilty about it. So, stepping up from this exhaustion to ruins, because it's quite related, um, the last journal we were producing is looking at ruins not as something negative, but rather as something positive, holding at the same time memory from the past and the promise of a future. Because by talking about territory, it will be always about present and future, acknowledging past. So complicated. Exploring the thematic along several axes and not willing to romanticize, but rather to problematize the ruins and relocate them in time. What today is a ruin was somewhere in a structure. What today is nature was maybe sometimes urbanized. What is urbanized today might be again nature in the future. What is country today can be see tomorrow. It all depends on what we, as demos, decide and how we implement our decisions. Yeah, the ruin through uh, thought as a structure in a precarious equilibrium that loses force and allows the unforeseen and the undetermined to emerge turns toward a radiant future. Architecture is unstable and in the background, the ruins is in this issue like the ruins of our everyday lives are examined for their capacity to act or to let act. So to release territory from exhaustion, we first need to understand each other and to build a common knowledge. So I think this is why we are here. We first need to agree that the territory is exhausted. And for curing exhaustion, I propose we start by shifting our focus on care and culture in order to give our attention to a world in constant transformation. So for that I propose, this is what you proposed, Exhausted territory aims to explore lines on how to relate to a territory, establishing new collective contracts in the rural and urban milieus, promoting alliances with other forms of life, reflecting on resources and the obtention of energy, analyzing the circularity of processes and confronting the contemporary environmental issues together. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that's why I got lost on the way, you know. <laughs> so, we have, I propose three different possibilities uh, to look at the situations right now. Either we are the photographer Marais and we look at the situation in movement uh, by looking at different steps of this movement, right, from one point of view. Or, we look as uh, in the Matrix movie, the set of the Matrix movie, at one situation that is static, but we look from different point of views. Or we look uh, at the future with a bit of divination and uh, using some I Ching uh, uh, divinatory system to try to understand the future a bit better. And we can do all of this together at the same time with three amazing guests. <laughs> uh, Sebastian Maro, uh, I will present you, Lara Almarsegui and Carles Oliver. I present you all now and then after I let you have the floor and I said nothing for an hour. Uh, it will be around 20 to 30 minutes per guest uh, to get some time for having conversation that you are all invited to take part in. So Sébastien uh, Marot holds a master in philosophy, a PhD in history, and a habilitation to direct researchers. Um, between 1986 uh, and 2002, you were a general delegate of the Société Française des Architectes in Paris, and you were, uh, where you organized numerous series of lectures in the history of architecture and architectural theory. You launched there the journal Le Visiteur, uh, uh, which was... Uh, quite an interesting position on uh, how to look at things from the visiting uh, position. You wrote extensively on the genealogy of the contemporary theories in architecture, urban, and landscape design. You're currently professor at the École d'Architecture de Man la vallee after having taught in many international universities, among which we can cite Architectural Association, ETH, Zurich, Harvard, and so on. Uh, among your exhibited work, you created a large exhibition lately in 
2029 for the Lisbon Architecture Triennial called Taking the Countryside, Archi Agriculture and Architecture. Lara, Lara Almarcegui, uh, you are an artist and you built up your artistic practice uh, around exploring the material aspects of land and urban space. For over 20 years, uh, Lara has worked in different cities, identifying abandoned, unused or forgotten sites and examining the contemporary transformation processes brought about by social, political and economic change. In recent years, you have turned your attention to construction sites, in particular the composite materials used in construction of new buildings and the cyclical relationship between land and architecture. You have had many solo and group exhibitions show around the world, uh, and you completed, for example, the commission for numerous international biennials and represented Spain at the 55th uh, Venice Biennial in 2013. And then, in the end, we will uh, listen also to Carles Oliver Barcelo, who is an architect from the Barcelona School of Architecture and a stonemason master builder uh, for professional necessity. Since 2009, you are a member of the Balearic Housing Institute, IBARI, where you have directed the climate change adaptation project Life Reusing Posidonia, funded by the Life Plus program, which has been awarded with the 20, 2021 Life Award for Best Environment Project by the European Commission. You have been also co-author of some other pilot projects. Um, I'm very happy to have you three here, and I'm quite impressed, and that's why I talk too much. So I leave you the first. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so uh, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very thrilled to participate to that conversation. I hope uh, that what I brought uh, will be relevant uh, to think about, um, let's say, the reasons for the exhaustion of uh, territories nowadays. It was at least the subject of this exhibition that you mentioned, that we first uh, put together at the Lisbon Architecture Tree and now four years ago already, um, uh, and it's, uh, well, yeah, uh, we of course know uh, what are the reasons uh, of exhaustion and the context <laughs> of exhaustion uh, nowadays, and so we thought, I thought, I've been now teaching the history of environment in schools of architecture for almost 20 years, um, and one of the subjects that really attracted my attention Uh, while piling up reference to build these kinds of uh, courses, was the very interesting link between two very important activities uh, around, uh, you know, uh, of subsistence, which are um, one, agriculture, and two, architecture, which, in fact, are in a ve very bad situation <laughs> uh, today. Um, but which were, in fact, twins, you know. They emerged, uh, so we did this uh, exhibition, sorry. They, I show a few uh, images of that uh, exhibition we put up in uh, uh, Lisbon. It was a huge uh, exhibition. I'm not going into any detail uh, about that, but reflect, like, providing references, moments in history that we might want to have in mind Um, as a kind of rear-view mirror when we um, reflect on the condition, today's condition of uh, territories. And that might help us maybe th find a way through, maybe. So that was the exhibition, the kind of hardliner uh, stuff uh, like that. It has moved in different places since. It's a kind of nave and we keep uh, feeding uh, that stuff in Lausanne, in Lyon. Uh, in Brussels, um, in Marseille, and now we're going in Italy. It was, um, we had this, like, composed a huge illustrated timeline, which is basically my course uh, <laughs> of the history of the environment for architects that I've been teaching for years. You know, just showing this, you know, so from the Paleolithic uh, to uh, today. Um, insisting, of course, on that Neolithic moment, you know, uh, 
where both two, those two, let's say, disciplines of domestication, agriculture, domesticating plants and animals, and architecture, domesticating humans on those very cultivated territories with which they enter in co-evolution, you know, being more and more sedentary. So agriculture and architecture are not only twin, but taken in a kind of uh, uh, autocatalytic loop, hen and egg, you know. Um, and looking then, of course, at the history, uh, parallel histories of those two fields of activities, uh, with the first empires, uh, uh, then uh, this kind of fascinating period that we name the medieval, you know, or uh, we don't know exactly what was happening there. It was a kind of par long parenthesis, you know. <laughs> We've all been taught history a bit like that. Uh, uh, from which, uh, from the Renaissance on, you know, uh, history, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> comes again, and etc. So, of course, the Renaissance, etc., cetera, the, um, uh, the rise of market economy, uh, basically. Um, the, what Marx called, you know, the three centuries of what Marx called the primitive accumulation of capital through colonies, slavery, uh, through, and in uh, Europe itself, through the enclosures, uh, the dispossession of uh, peasants and farmers, uh, etc. And seizing up, you know, of course, with uh, the so-called um, re uh, industrial uh, revolution, which started to, in a way, divorce those two kinds of disciplines and kind of divorced cities from uh, 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 those resource, basic resource territories, which we name uh, countryside. Uh, you know, all of this, you know, being taken in the great acceleration of consumption of those past uh, decades, and leading to a situation which we described a bit like this, you know, uh, it's a caricature, of course, in the center, growing metropolises, uh, both in density and in extension. Uh, we, we've been all told, you know, that uh, we are more now globally than 50% urban, that in 2050 it might be 70%. Of course, in our countries it's much more uh, uh, already. Uh, so this complete, you know, uh, image of the accumulation of capital in given uh, areas, metropolises uh, there, and around a series of issues, right? Uh, such as, for instance, um, the rarefaction. Can I? It, it, it works how? The pointer? Ah, 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 okay. So, okay. So, water scarcity. Uh, uh, here, um, soil depletion, erosion, um, pollution of soil. Uh, of course, climate change and biodiversity uh, collapse, uh, leading to all kinds of emerging uh, dis disease and pandemics uh, stuff. But also uh, here, the exhaustion, or you know, uh, predictive exhaustion, uh, not only of uh, fossil uh, fuels, but also of metals, of minerals, of all kinds of stuff, on which. Um, the industrial revolutions, you know, uh, that, that activated all those uh, stuff, you know. So a, a series of issues uh, around that which question, in a way, whether metropolises are really the manifest destiny of humankind. So our exhibition was about questioning this, um, and I summed up, in a way, the, the thing by saying, if you think about the situation nowadays, you know, um, you are taken in a kind of cognitive dissonance. You cannot avoid it. Uh, when looking back at the past, it all seems as if the urbanization of the world, which has been steadily growing for centuries, and especially in the three, two to three last centuries, is inevitable, is integral to history. But at the same time, 
um, when probing the future, I know it's not a very easy uh, task to do, uh, and looking at the environmental issues that are looming there, and we, we just, uh, um, then this same global urbanization looks rather improbable, impossible, and like the end of history. So I would think that, I think that we are in a situation, it's a very weird situation, you know, that looks both inevitable and impossible. <laughs> that, that's a tricky uh, stuff. How you, do you deal with uh, such a uh, uh, situation? So uh, our exhibition was about that. So I, would, I wanted to say a word in this exhibition for prophets. <laughs> Uh, prophets like uh, people like that, you know, the Atelier Paysan uh, uh, in France, for instance, uh, or those peasants who think that we should like badly uh, have much more peasants uh, now, uh, today, to reclaim the earth from and the soil from machines, uh, uh, etc. Or one of my heroes, uh, David Holmgren, uh, one of the co-founder of permaculture. Uh, this is really one of the books that I really advise everybody to read uh, today. It was published in 2002, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. I emphasize this beyond sustainability because the French translation, they published the French translation, which is very good, by the way, but the title says, um, Principes et pistes d'action vers un mode de vie soutenable. No. <laughs> It's really beyond uh, sustainability. And now I'm just going to uh, concentrate on, uh, which was the last section of the exhibition. Um, but this is a, a there is a little book that uh, David published uh, 10 years ago already, even more, called Future Scenarios, in which he proposes a reflection on our situation, which I find highly helpful and relevant. This is what he says, basically. It's all about that diagram. He says, we are confronted not to one kind of problem nowadays, but to two kinds of, of problems. One, he calls here, you see, uh, climate change, global warming, right? Uh, global warming might develop slowly and mildly or brutally and violently, right? So this is, you know, this gradient from mild to severe. But you could add here um, biodiversity collapse, um, uh, soil erosion. I would generalize that first uh, vector as the progressive degradation of the conditions on, of life on our planet of which climate change, uh, biodiversity collapse, uh, etc., are different dimensions. But the, if, if that was not enough, <laughs> there is another kind of problem, which is here, and which he calls oil decline. But you could also here add minerals, metals, rare earth, you know, all the resources typical of the, the Industrial Revolution, the ongoing Industrial Revolution. And I, you could call, I think, this vector, which also this decline could be slow or severe there, you could call it, you know, the means of power for humanity to adapt, you know, the environment to, you know, its well-being uh, in a way. Right? The power. It's the gradient of power. Now, what is very, uh, I think, uh, intelligent is he crosses those two things. And then you obtain four quadrants, which are four very different kinds of scenarios. First scenarios, the, the nicest. Mm, you know, slow development, slow degradation of the conditions of life, and slow decline of resources, of power. Oh, that is great, you know, and he calls it the green tech. Green tech because you still have powers, minerals, energy, fossil energy, you know, to 
uh, build on an industrial uh, uh, scale, you know, uh, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, uh, everything, to mitigate uh, the problem or to prepare for the moment, you know, or to try to reach a kind of steady state economy. Right? That's a dream uh, in which many of our countries uh, are. Other situation, you still have a lot of power, but you're confronted to a severe, more progressively more and more severe degradation of the conditions of life. And each time the IPCC gives you know, a new uh, report, we are going up uh, on this gradient uh, there. And this situation he calls um, brown tech. Brown is the fascist uh, meaning uh, of things. If you have a lot of power and you're confronted to very severe degradation of the conditions of life, oh, you can expect very dirigist uh, 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 power state control, uh, etc. High-tech uh, stuff, you know, uh, and social control. China, 0.3, you know, <laughs> or 0.4, uh, that stuff. If you are in the opposite quadrant, where still slow degradation, but severe decline of resources, you know, of power. That's the ideal scenario for permaculture. Right? Um, you could expect, according to Holmgren, exactly the reverse evolution that was that of the Industrial Revolution that led to the concentration of people into cities, to the you know, rural exodus, uh, etc. You can expect exactly the reverse, because then people will have to get closer to the very fragile uh, living uh, sources of energy and take care of them in a completely different ways. So it would be, in uh, Holmgren's view, a scenario of urban exodus. You know, uh, new, totally new uh, uh, relationship to the ter to the territories, uh, to rural territories, to uh, all that kind. And then you have the most severe uh, in. A, well, you know, everything is... Uh, <laughs> so, you don't... It's, this is the survivalist uh, scenarios, right? Uh, in that last scenario, oh, you don't have world wars, because you don't do world wars without big uh, power, right? But it's still a bit of a Mad Max uh, uh, situation, a new kind of feudal uh, uh, stuff, tribes, you know, I mean... We, we can see it coming in, in many ways. Okay, so um, we did for our exhibition not a translation of that, but something that had, has a bit to do with this, which is, um, I was a bit uh, puzzled when I heard you know, people reacting to the, this, kind, this situation that I just uh, described, of exhaustion of territories, of resources, of, of everything, I could hear different narratives, you know, and I wanted to distinguish them. This is what philosophers like to do, like distinguishing different kinds of uh, songs, you know. And we did, did in a little um, compass. Ah, oh, just one thing. Uh, David, of course, says that beware. Those different scenarios, even if they are defined by very different conditions, which I described, are not um, ex exclusive from one another. Why? Because every region of the world is not in the same situation, right? For instance, David is uh, Australian. Australia has a lot of coal. You know, it's not going to be rare tomorrow, you know, uh, power. But it's exposed in a bad ways to the consequence of climate change, for instance. You know, so he thinks that Australia is heading to brown tech uh, very quickly. But New Zealand, it's another situation, right? Uh, maybe he can dream of a, of a green tech uh, uh, still for a moment. Uh, but also, not only that, but they are almost nested into one another. 
like Russian puppets because of the number of people in any given situation who bet on that scenario or that other. And even, he says, one single person can, in a way, you know, <laughs> have them in mind, you know, on the domestic level, trying to reach self-sufficiency. Uh, on the community level, being in a kind of uh, earth steward uh, uh, stuff, you know, on m working at the same time in a, in a factory that builds solar panels or wind turbines, and when it's time to vote, well, still voting for a kind of strong <laughs> government in case this uh, doesn't work, you know, uh, uh, okay. So what we did, <clears throat> anyway, what we did is a kind of compass, similar, but not translating this, just trying to distinguish those different narratives that I hear around uh, on that situation. So on the future relationship of cities and countries, of architecture and agriculture. One scenario I call incorporation. It's Industrial Revolution 3, 4.0. Uh, 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 it's the idea that only a new industrial technical revolution is able to solve the problems created by the, the preceding ones, right? So more into the same, more of the same uh, in a way. Uh, Elon Musk takes us to the moon, new frontiers, uh, you know, uh, I think. So in our uh, situation, it's the city incorporates the country, incorporates in the capitalistic sense of the world. No more peasants, you know, it's factories completely in a, now. Uh, so, you know, you have buildings that grow food within the city, you know, every, <laughs> technology, uh, uh, everything. It drains it, uh, uh, the, the forces and the resource from the whole uh, territory. It's a tower of control uh, of everything and of farming, of course. Uh, also. Second scenario, and some architects are like, like that very much, you know. Uh, I mean, architects are very happy when uh, someone tells them that, the, yes, the city is the manifest destiny of humankind, you know. They are basically, many of them, happy. Others are happy with another scenario that says, oh no, cities are going, yes, they are going to grow. Uh, it's inevitable. But they are going to integrate agriculture as a part of its program. It's going to be a hybrid uh, city. It's a bit the Broadacre city of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, uh, in a way. It's going to integrate uh, agriculture. It's, you could say, agricultural urbanism. Right? You keep extending, uh, but of course, you, know, you mix uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, all kinds of stuff within uh, the development of the city. Some architects like it also because, you know, uh, keeps going. <clears throat> then you have the reverse movement, which I would call infiltration, which is generally what we mean by urban agriculture. So these are initiatives, you know, of agricultural initiatives of all kinds, that permeates within the fabric of existing cities that transform a leftover, the roofs, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So it's more of a movement that comes from, you could say, the countryside or the background, that permeates into the city. It's usually acupunctural, uh, but it can happen on a big scale. Think of uh, La Habana, Cuba, uh, during the special period, no more importation from the Soviet Union. Oh, all of a sudden, you cultivate everything, and it became the mecca uh, of permaculture for te 10 to 15 years, right? Detroit, same kind of uh, uh, situation for other reasons where, you know, the city is being cultivated uh, there. And there is a last scenario <laughs> that I think must be there, which is really the polar opposite of the first. And which I call, um, so that's infiltration, you see, uh, well, it's difficult to represent, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, you see a gas station that becomes a, a farmer's market, you know, <laughs> three days a week, I mean, this kind of uh, uh, stuff. And then the last scenario, when you do an exhibition, you, you don't do uh, 
So I called it secession. Secession, uh, to name all that movement, of those movements of people who don't believe any longer that the metropolis holds the key uh, of the future, and that, you know, secede from metropolitan areas, uh, even if they stay in their orbit, you know, but secede from their uh, biopower uh, stuff to reorganize locally uh, and become locally more and more autonomous, uh, more and more uh, resilient, you know, from uh, anything. Uh, and so we described it. Uh, so there, maybe there are many basseries uh, uh, <laughs> in this, uh, but active basseries uh, uh, in this last uh, uh, scenario. Um, like, needless to say, that uh, I, I think this scenario is the more historically uh, relevant, uh, in my view. Of course, they all have a part of truth, <laughs> you know. Uh, and again, like Holmgren's scenarios, they are not exclusive of one another, they are actually happening at the same time now. But they translate very different understandings of the reasons of the uh, mess and the shit we are into, right? Um, I do think that any <laughs> political agenda which do not have a, as its ultimate, ultimate end to make people or to help people be less dependent on the mega uh, structure, any politic that has not that in, in, in its mind is futile. Uh, anyway, so that's it. Uh, I, and I leave you with that question. Uh, what is a world? Uh, and I have a kind of, I still have a kind of uh, provisional uh, answer that I propose to you. Uh, it's a territory, a region, a country, I don't know the scale, you know, where one, you, <laughs> collectively, individually, could reasonably imagine to project and spend your entire existence. Okay. Ah, like the Zapatistas, for instance. Thank you for your attention. much. Oh. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. All right. Let me see how I do that. Uh, okay. Maybe maybe I can stand. So okay. I feel a bit more uh, as you want. to warm up a little bit. Did you see me okay? Yeah. It, it is very important that if you don't hear me or you don't understand my English, I sometimes mix up languages. You sh stop me and I try to rephrase it again. You can also do that, uh, Joanna. And I say it again in better English or more slow. Spanish, whatever necessary. So thanks, thanks a lot for this uh, invitation to think about uh, exhaustion in territory. It's um, it's a very very uh, important su subject. I've been looking at um, construction and how construction uh, affects and causes change in ground and land since uh, some years, and uh, I think it is. Uh, Quite, a, quite an important thing to think about land, what happened with land uh, due to construction. Even if I'm, I mean, I'm an artist, not an architect, obviously, you wanna say it. But uh, I'm very curious, I always have been very curious about architecture, space. I try to understand how space uh, function. And I have been doing that while looking at buildings. I have been always looking, walking around, looking at construction. And in a way, I'm very curious about them. I like to understand them, and I analyze them, but I also, at the same time, I always get a little bit angry, because uh, when I look at construction, I also feel like there is too much construction. I mean, I must say, I started my practice in the 90s, when here uh, there was like this big excitement of building, building, designing, construction, there was this, uh, how should I describe, furor, uh, huge uh, uh, energy into, into building, and I feel like, this was too much. Uh, the whole space around me seemed to be 
completely rationalize. We all know architecture, construction, uh, controls, gives uh, uh, function. Uh, it's a, a rationalization of space, and I really feel like I, I cannot stand it. It's, it's really too much. It, it, this doesn't work for me. So what I did uh, since a very young artist, I started to do uh, works that were standing against architecture practice, or stand, let's say standing against construction. And sometimes they were really ob almost obvious or naive. Like I would, for example, stand against demolitions, like opposed to demolitions, because you cannot build if there is no demolition. I mean, one thing is part of the other. So stopping demolitions or uh, presenting demolitions so people are aware of them, it was one of the things I did. Uh, for example, I was also digging. I have been excavating, looking at the underneath a lot, like buildings vertical up, uh, digging, simple, the opposite. Or I've been um, defending wastelands, defending empty lot, descampados, um, as a places that uh, somehow managed to escape um, architecture. So I've been kind of looking at ways to, um, uh, yeah, really stand against uh, construction, basically, in many different uh, ways. Ah, yeah, that's... In a way, I want to focus today because of exhaustion and resources. I start, uh, something I also start to do uh, was to um, identify the construction materials necessary to make a building and make a list of materials and then present the materials. So to say a water tower, a building is 50 cubic meters of uh, brick or 100 tons of brick. It was a way to uh, put the building in pieces and again uh, say to the construction A, uh, I'm fighting with you, like uh, standing against. So this was the first time I did this project. This was a water tower abandoned in France in Fasburg, and we identified the construction materials used to build it. As you can read, 50 cubic meters of brick, 12 cubic meters of stone, 4 cubic meters of concrete, a little bit of iron, plaster, and then we pile it up. We borrow the materials, and so in this way we show all the materials necessary to make a building. We analyze the building. We this built, we put the building in pieces, which was a very interesting thing uh, to me because I had this confrontation issue with uh, architectural construction. Something important for me in this project, uh, I was a young artist and I was kind of learning art and also architecture around and I was collecting definition of what art is or architecture. And something I came across a lot was this idea that art is images and I thought, I disagree with that. For me, art has to be much more than images. For me, image is, is just too little, or to say architecture is an image. And I remember other definition of uh, architecture I read in the newspaper in an interview um, was architecture. To, to a famous architect, uh, he said architecture is the space within a building. This kind of mystic uh, definitions of architecture, they say like this is amazing, I should admire it. I thought, ah, come on, no, Our architecture is the drainage, is the pipes, is the tons of concrete. So I, I had this kind of almost um, punk disagreement. So that's why I started putting buildings in tons to say, no, it's not there, please, don't, don't tell me that. That's a little bit, let's say, no, a building is the, con the concrete. Um, and then, of course, this work is a lot about uh, the enormous amount of materials necessary to make a building, which seems like it was not important for these people saying architecture is air or is images. No? The materials were not, this was not an issue uh, at that time. I, know, I don't know if you remember, but this was not something in interesting. Uh, years later, uh, I did a similar project, but with a building that was scheduled to be demolished. This was a house, ah, I will point it, it was a small house just like a garage, oh, I cannot be so precise, and this one here, two floors, and it was scheduled to be demolished in Belgium, and I agreed with the demolition company to give me the rubble for the project, so we did what is called the rubble mountain, La Montaña de Escombros, and this is the same rubble of the house, so this is the, the not similar amount of materials necessary to build the, the house, but the real rubble of the house. What is interesting of this work, obviously, is the scale one one, so, this is the, the whole house as it is, and it is an enormous uh, amount of material. Uh, if the water tower, the project before, was talking about the origin of a building, this is talking about the end of a building. And of course, it's much more interesting. Since I started doing that kind of work, I never did the, the other work before, because the end, the suggesting the ruin, suggesting what happened with, with a building when it disappeared, is much more um, interesting uh, subject. Okay, a fast anecdote. 
the water tower in France was censored by the mayor of the uh, French village because, uh, well, he didn't agree with the idea that art are materials or architecture. And uh, this one in Belgium was not censored because there, is, there was less censorship in Belgium, but it was very hated and discussed. This, these works were considered highly provocative, but they, they are just materials. They are just construction materials. They are just saying, hey, this is not air, this is rubble. And this was like very, very problematic, if you remember uh, that time. In a similar way, when I was invited to Secession, the, um, the art center in, in Vienna, we calculate again all the construction materials necessary to build the exhibition space. We made a list, identifying all the materials, and then we borrow them in uh, rubble. It looks very clean, very organized, but these are, um, this is how the demolition material is treated in Vienna after uh, demolition. So for example, you see the, mort uh, the brick and the mortar. Looks super clean, el mortero de, de los ladrillos. Uh, and I've seen the plant where they put it in a machine that shake it and separate it into this very, very clean material. So you see a building uh, presenting the same amount of materials necessary to build it. All these works are about the enormous, enormous uh, scale of construction. And actually, these are small buildings because I cannot work with the big ones. They are just too big. When I was invited to the Venice Biennale, we did a similar, uh, the Spanish Pavilion, 2013. We did a similar calculation of the materials and then we piled them up, the same am amount of materials necessary to build the Spanish pavilion, presented inside the Spanish pavilion. A big difference from the Vienna project is that in, uh, in Venice they don't separate so much as in Vienna, so all the mountains that you have seen completely separated, the brick, the concrete, the terrazzo, in uh, Venice was one big mountain. It was a mountain of over 600 cubic meters of rubble, rubble uh, escombros, uh, and it contained uh, the concrete, the mortar, the cement, the tiles, the roof tiles, the brick, and then separately there were smaller piles of the, the glass and the iron and the wood were st still separated, but the main material was this. So it's an enormous amount of material. And then it suggests clearly the end of an architecture. It uh, brings to question what happened to buildings that are demolished in, Vie um, in uh, Venice nowadays. But it also, it can provoke the collapse of the building. Because if a building has to carry the same amount of materials constructed to build it, it could collapse really physically. Those stuff, uh, these materials are really very heavy. They are really a lot. So it's suggesting the ruin and at the risk of uh, causing it, which is a very interesting uh, question. I said we were in 2013 because, as you remember, was, uh, we, we had a long uh, uh, financial crisis and there was a lot of suffering because of it in Spain. And people were uh, reading this work and interpreting as a result, as a comment on the, on the Spanish uh, financial crisis. I don't think it was so direct as that. This was a project about the building, but my whole practice, I think, was very uh, inspired by what I was seeing that was going on in Spain, this enormous ex excitement and party of celebration of building, building, building. That surrounded me everywhere. Uh, this this uh, state of things, I think, kind of pushed me to, um, to answer to it with this kind of works. So in a way, it was related to the uh, crisis, but in a very, very different way. Sometimes I cannot pile up my materials when it's too much. And then I just put the list. So my only artwork is a list of all the construction materials. This is a work I did in Sao Paulo when I was invited to Sao Paulo Biennale. I thought um, it would be very challenging, instead of calculating all the materials of a building, to calculate a city. And a city like Sao Paulo, like a, a city uh, with the, 12, uh, the city of 12 million uh, inhabitants. And uh, well, it is just a, a text. But uh, we spent more than three uh, months, a team of five people, uh, doing the calculation. Just to say, to tell you that it's not something we took from Google or Wikipedia. It's not a statistic. Uh, one inhabitant consumes this amount of concrete, so 12 million, this, no. This was a real calculation. And I, I like the idea that the presentation is very simple. It looks like a really little thing, but there was a enormous uh, research behind. 
So you see all the materials necessary to build the constructed um, city of Sao Paulo. I find something I find interesting of this work, of course the, the challenge uh, was uh, exciting to me, but I wanted to point the, the first material, well, it's in Portuguese, because this was presented in Sao Paulo Biennale, and I think it's important to keep the, the work in the original language, because I mean, this work never uh, caused any kind of censorship or complaint, but I find it highly provocative. I, I, I never understood why people don't get angry because of this work, uh, but uh, it, people don't get angry, but I am putting Sao Paulo in pieces. So it stays in Portuguese, and the, the first material, concreto, concrete, argamasa, mortar, and tijolo is uh, brick, um, concrete, uh, hormigón, y uh, mortero. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, uh, ask, uh, telling you to, to pay attention to this because I think it's a very important question I want to address now, which is concrete. Um, you are also very interested in it. Uh, the question of aggregates. What are the components of concrete? I think the same as people discuss little land and ground and ownership of land, concrete is also not much discussed. When it's actually, you see, the biggest volume of materials. Because if we are discussing ecology and exhaustion, scale is super important. So um, this work is part of a series we have here. It's a series of, of publications on wastelands here at the Bilbao one. You can look at it uh, later if you like. These are publications that really mimic architectural guides. They are guides of a modern, they copy the guides of a modern architecture. But instead of uh, pointing uh, buildings, they point wastelands, the songias de descampados. And uh, when I was invited to, take, um, to be part of an exhibition in Basel, uh, Basilea in Switzerland, I uh, decided to make this publication talking about 10 of the most interesting empty grounds uh, that are exhausted and destroyed because the, production, the extraction of gravel and sand aggregates for the production of concrete. So um, this, um, this guide presents uh, the areas uh, uh, that have been serving for the construction of Basel, where the construction materials of Basel are coming from. And uh, well, it's a bit too, we don't have enough time to go through this uh, guide, but I can tell you that these uh, are uh, destroyed pieces of land, and some are lakes in, fr in the French area mainly, and they look like wonderful pieces of nature through, but actually it's quite a lot of destruction going on. Some uh, have been filled up, some have been filled up with uh, chemical waste in Switzerland. In the 60s, chemical waste was used to fill up quarries. Later, um, construction rubble, demolition rubble, escombros. Uh, nowadays, uh, earth, what they call clean earth, uh, from excavations. In Germany, they also fill them up, but um, they, call, they make meadows with cows, like they, they create wonderful uh, agricultural land, but they call that compensation patch, which is something that is used to compensate other um, construction, or let's say, destruction if, if you want. So anyway, it's quite juicy and so when, when people discuss mining and everything goes normally very far away to another continent, like this happened like far away, please be aware of aggregates and concrete because it happened, I would say, 10 kilometers where we are here, I think one kilometer anyway. So it is really near and the, and the volume is enormous. Besides the publication of the, of the uh, guide to the, of the abandoned uh, uh, gravel quarries. I also did another thing as part of the project. I asked the smaller, the smallest of the gravel quarries, a family-run uh, gravel quarry, to, uh, I asked them how much they extract every day. They extract 1,000 tons every day, and they extract with excavator a material that it comes together sand with gravel. And it's uh, one, one four of sand, one of gravel like this size, uh, one like this and one like that, so four kind of materials. So I asked them to bring to the square where I had the show, the, the, the square of the art fair, uh, the production of gravel of that day, which is 250 tons of, this, of the big gravel. So this was Monday. Oh, I can point. So this was the Monday uh, extraction of the big gravel, because actually, so this is 250 tons, it's 1,000 tons of all the mixture. And then on Tuesday, they also bring again their uh, extraction, 250 more tons. And then Wednesday, I have, okay, at, at the end of the week. So basically, you see, and 
What I like of this work repeats itself, like bringing up 250 again next day. But this is how extraction go. Eh? Don't think extraction ends in one day. So one day, next day, they blast. Actually, here they blast. I must say, Renzola is blasting. They blast and again and again, and you know it's kind of ongoing. So that's what I was trying to present with this work, which is uh, well, okay. People call megalomaniac this kind of work I do, but compared with the building you see behind Herzog de Miró, you know, this is nothing. And I also choose to work uh, on purpose because budget doesn't allow. I choose to work with the smallest family-run um, gravel quarry in Basel because now there are over 10 active gravel quarries. So this extracts 1,000, but the other ones from Hossein Lafarge, they extract over 10,000 by day. So actually, if, if you do the calculation, that puts you, I think, over 60,000 by day near Basel. Eh? It's not a poor area. Uh, I think uh, a bit um, exhausted myself. I, I'm almost finishing, eh? just uh, three minutes. <laughs> but myself a bit ex exhausted of all this pileup uh, of materials and extraction. I, my next project was kind of the opposite. I asked to a big uh, gravel quarry, in this case in Catalonia, uh, Sorille company, whom extracts and also um, produce uh, prefab uh, in construction. It's, it's quite a big company. So I ask for my project to stop. For one day, halt the plant and halt extraction. No extraction for one day. It's very simple. Just silent and a, fri a Friday. They accept. Uh, so we had this project, which is an event of just doing nothing for one day. And then we opened to the public for two hours. Just two hours is really brief. But it was special because what we had, okay, people, the public uh, walking along the plant, uh, surrounded by this big uh, montage of material. So I, I did nothing, just this. But what the public could see is this material that is geological material that comes, in the case of Spain, from the Pyrenees, so from the very high mountains. It has been well underneath millions of years ago, then comes up, then it's eroded by the rains and the small st streams, then it goes to the big river in a travel, a geological travel of thousands of years of time. And in geology, that's the thing with geology, it's scary because when you talk about geology, you are always in million years, if you're lucky, thousand years. So this material has this, this travel of million and thousands of years, and then it's deposited by the river on the shore, and then it's extracted and then it's bring to the plant, and then it's gonna become part of concrete and construction on Monday. For one day, it's stop. And that's what we do, look at it for one day, stop. It's nothing, it's also um, uh, very interesting to me, actually. And I will uh, finish connecting to this idea of uh, stopping with the projects I am very busy now, well, the last seven years, but I'm, uh, I find uh, interesting to continue. These are the projects on mineral rights, derechos uh, mineros, or the Derechos Minerales, which um, I don't know if you know what this means, the, the concept. I, I ask because I didn't know. Before I started this project, I didn't know what the Derechos Mineros Mineral Rights are. And the day I hear people talking about mineral rights, I was very shocked because it changed, it changed my, my mind. It, something blew up in, um, in it. Um, mineral rights, as they are highly discussed in America and United States. People talk about it in Dallas. Uh, to me for the first time. Mineral rights referred with the idea that the ownership of um, the underneath is not the same as the ownership of land. It's this concept of vertical property. I think architects, you know that, that sometimes the ownership of land is not the same as the ownership of the building. Not this most people know in architecture. Um, but the air on top of the building or the underneath is owned by the government. So it's different, no? You follow? ¿Seguís? O sea, la propiedad del suelo no es lo mismo que la propiedad de lo que hay debajo del suelo. It's, it's weird, but that's the way it is, actually. So when I hear about it, I thought, oh, but no one talks about it in Europe. What's going on? How does it work? So I did an extended uh, Google. I live in Rotterdam in the Netherlands for many, many years. And then after a while, I found this map. This is not my work. This is a map from the um, Ministry of Economy the section of uh, mining, and it presents all the mineral rights given in the Netherlands at, at that moment. Uh, you see uh, different, the word is concession, concession. You see the existing concession, where they are d different. The, the orange are exploration, and the yellow are extraction concessions, and this is Rijsbeek concession, and this is in Rotterdam, where I was when I see this. So I, I click this to see who is the owner, which is NAM, I contact NAM, and they call me from Shell. 
So basically, I found out that Shell, the famous Shell company, owns the mineral rights below my city, where I am living and trying to have a kind of normal life and try to do my work and think about underneath and think about land. And Shell owns us, and actually it's extraction concentration. They own us and they are sucking us. No one knows. No one knows. It's, you know, it was really like, yeah, this day I, I found about it. I mean, the day I was alone in my studio, two o'clock in the night, and I couldn't believe this map because uh, the extended of it is like, uh, you know, we, we don't know what we are talking about when we talk about resources, when we talk about ground. We know nothing. I know nothing. This, this is it, you know. So this change um, totally changed me, and I decided to start a project um, which uh, uh, was about discussing these things, the, own, the ownership of the underneath, and how the underneath is, is split like a cake. Like the map you see is like a cake where uh, different companies own different uh, pieces. So to talk about it, I decided myself, Lara, to have uh, mining rights. And I'm not interested to have mining rights of uh, oil and gas. I don't say go oil and gas, I'm not interested. It's just they are not my subject uh, because I am into the material and I'm into construction and architecture. And um, well, for me, the very interesting uh, are the minerals used for architecture and clearly iron is the thing. The iron to produce steel is really basic uh, for concrete. I mean, most concrete is armor by iron. And I have an obsession and an interest in concrete. So iron is really the thing I want to talk about. I also decided to talk about iron because no one seemed to be interested in iron. Whenever I say mining, everyone say, said at that time rare earths. Nowadays, everyone is with lithium and seems like iron is really not sexy. No one is interested. I thought, OK, that's, that's my thing. And um, I tried to have iron mining rights. OK, I will speed up. I'm a bit giving too many details. I, in, in Germany, I failed. In Spain, I failed. And then I end in Norway, where the mining uh, law is a little bit more democratic. And you're looking at a map of all the concessions of minerals in Norway, the black spots. And OK, um, we are approaching Oslo. Oslo is on the right side. And this is the one uh, I apply. So it's one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer of uh, mining rights, well, you don't see very well. Oh. But um, if you click in the square, this is again a, a website by the Ministry um, of Economy the, and Geological site, and this is my name as the owner of the mining rights. So it's just one square kilometer. So I don't own the ground. I'm not interested in owning the ground. Actually, I find it a bit boring. All these artists, when they want to talk about ground, the first thing they do, they buy it. I think there must be other ways to talk about things that don't demand buying it. So I own the rights to the iron below. Uh, what is interesting about it is that the, um, the mining law says the mining rights are until the middle of the earth, uh, in infinite distance. So it's like uh, something like that, like a conic. And they are exploration mining rights. Uh, they are not extraction. So this work is about uh, awareness. I just want that everyone knows what mining rights are and that our places are cut in pieces and organized by the governments in total silent. And then, of course, it's uh, uh, environmental. Yes, it's protected because I own it and it is exclusive. No one else can have this mining right. So the iron, this iron magnetite is 300 million years, 300 million years. So if you take it, you are taking anyone, uh, human, non-human, whatever you want, 300 million and forever. I mean, that's how things are. With, uh, I don't know if you ever thought about it as architects, but that's how it goes. Eh? Always, not, not me and not my work. That, that's geology, is the way it works. So that, that's protected. Um, and their exploration. Ah, OK, then I was not planning to show this one. This is in Austria. In Austria, the application is not one square, but you apply for one dot, and then you have 400. Uh, meters, well, 420 meters on a circle, and that's what I got the mining rights. Ah, oh, okay, and these are, that was also a Vulcano ashes I had in Spain, but I also lose because these are exploration mining rights. After a couple of years, I need to apply for extraction, and if I don't go for extraction, I lose them. That's how it works. So that's uh, very sad. I'm very happily saying I, I had mining rights, but I'm also losing mining rights, which is very painful. So this I lose. And uh, yeah, OK, I will finish now saying where I am now, which is a difficult place. So something I'm trying to do is to keep the mining rights. I'm losing the volcano. I lose. That's gone. Um, the 
Austrian, I lose them in five years, but then I apply again. I needed an, an address in Austria, and they are in Skype Institution, the art center. Now, in Norway, I lose them. And it was possible to apply one year later, which was this summer. And I was going to apply, and to my um, surprise, uh, the, the application procedure has changed. Now, just yes, Norwegian companies are allowed to apply for money and rights. And this was big disappointing. Luckily, they invited me for a show in Norway, and the first thing I told to this small art biennale helped me and applied for me. So actually, they just submit an application. Well, the, the art center submitted it didn't work, and now an art school is uh, submitting it. They just sent it just right now. Uh, so this work will move to Norwegian hands. It's uh, hard, but it's also interesting because they are changing the procedure because the world is changing. Now they don't want foreigners to own uh, resources in, uh, in Norway. So what I'm really now is trying to keep these things one way or another with the help uh, I need. But then I also, I think, as you, I hope you are also by now, I'm also a little bit tired of uh, follow, obeying the mining law. I am a little bit fed up of the mining law. And I think it's maybe a moment to start questioning it because really the planet is, is, is really, we are in a very difficult moment and it's a moment to question it. And people are bringing up the discussion of the rights of the nature. So I think it's a good moment. I think the best place to question is the new resources. So for example, this one, well, this is about a workshop I did. This is in La Palma, there was a volcano, 20 cubic, um, uh, t uh, 20 cubic kilometers of lava, new material that was not there. And who owns it? Well, who owns it? I think it's the moment to question it because it's so new uh, that it, there is space to discuss it and where we are now, and I think it has to be discussed. The mining law uh, knows very well who owns it. Uh, the mining law, I will tell you by memory, uh, the mining law says, a ver, if I remember, los recursos naturales están ahí para el uso y el aprovechamiento de todos los españoles. Uh, the, 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 res, the natural resources are there for the use and the profit of all the Spanish. It's very scary. I repeat this uh, sentence because I find it so scary, like this, that this is there, this is there for our use and profit. That, that's the idea. The nature is there to serve us. And this shocked me a lot. Um, but I also think the beginning of the sentence, the, the resources, the natural resources, the word resources, recursos, is super important in this conversation. We should pay more attention to it because it's the fact it's called resource, that it doesn't have the right to exist, that is inferior to us. That So I, I think all this uh, has to be questioned, and I think that's uh, where we should go. And I don't know how to do that. Thank you.